clicking it. And we're live. It's Friday, May 14th, 5.03 p.m. Eastern Time. We are at 2.03 p.m. Pacific Time. We are here with, uh, oh no, I screwed it up already. God damn it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I've done this 413 times and I still like can't remember. I like reinvented every time I do it. Um, we're not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we've got uh, Dr. Professor Dan Dworkis uh, to hang out with us today. Dan Dworkis. Which is like, not uh, Dan Dworkis. Yeah. Dan is now the, has the <laughs> illustrious, it took 413 episodes, uh. people, but someone finally typed their name wrong. <laughs> the, and how many degrees do you have, Dan? <laughs> From how it's many a handful. Fantasies? Yeah, it's a yeah, handful. Yeah, exactly. I, I thought None you were kidding. in typing. Uh, well, yeah. right. I thought you were being ironic and saying I was the first one, but am, am I actually the first one to type my name incorrectly into the thing? I think so. <laughs> I think that that's so like, we have had people who <laughs> like don't use their names, you know, yes. uh, or who uh, intentionally type something other than their name. Yes, which is, this was not that. But this no. was this <laughs> is the first typo in one's own name. But this is a straight yeah. up mistake. Yeah. Yes. Dan what are you gonna is an do? old friend of mine from college and after college and after, after, after college, we're still friends because uh, yes. they don't take it away unless they really do. Mm. Um, uh, cool. And, uh, and cool. um, Dan is now an emergency physician and a professor clinician in emergency medicine at USC. Um, and you live out in LA and you've mm -hmm. had been like emergency physicianing through the pandemic. And you have now written a book called The Emergency Mind, which we're going to get to eventually, which is gonna, I'm really looking forward to. But uh, first tell us a little bit about kind of like your path and how you got into emergency medicine, how you, yeah, how did you pick emergency medicine? Cause you were picking emergency medicine when you were at BU doing your MD PhD. And this was like our last time living in the same space like city together and seeing each other like on a regular basis, I think. So like walk us into like why you picked emergency medicine. Yeah, yeah. well, um, I was thinking about that, you know, so this morning when I was waking up about how it's been, that was like almost 10 years ago that we were hanging out regularly, which is a long time and, and I know. A crazy town. And you don't look a, a day older than 10 years ago. And uh, Ben, I just met you. You, you don't look a day right older things. either. Actually, <laughs> You know, the exactly degree the of falseness since yeah. my hair is a completely <laughs> different color than it was 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, and actually, so is one of my eyebrows. Yeah, Ben um, has one gray eyebrow wow. or a gray streak in one yeah. of his eyebrows. Yeah. It's very pronounced. And since the degree of falsity, as you say about me, is as extreme as it is, it kind of implies that Kate looked pretty different 10 years ago. I will show if like to, to make the point. Dan, I will show a picture of myself with the mohawk that I got. Oh, gave yeah. Myself. There was that. Uh, yeah. During, there so, was like, that. that will be the, that will pull the, that up by the, the Kate's end. Hair change, the, the Kate's hair changes are a constant. Yes. Um, I, I think uh, uh, since Kate looks to be about 25 or 26, um, or maybe sort of like 18 or 19. Um, like it I'm not could, sure what the appropriate face to make here is. So I'm, just, no, I'm, just, I'm just saying <laughs> like, it totally makes sense for her not to have aged a day uh, yes. since she was, in fact, 30, switching 26. topics. So off anyway, my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Case, yeah. But no, so, so we're hanging out in Boston in, in uh, Boston. 2009, 2010. And that was probably, as I think about it, probably during my PhD years, because I sort of stacked them together and um, got into everything sort of expecting that I'd be doing um, actually engineering and, and like building medical devices. And, yes, I remember uh, this. Was really into that and um, geez, ended up a patient in this tiny hospital in India. Uh, and almost, oh god, I remember that too. Yeah, Tell right? us about almost, that. Yeah, uh, almost bought the farm entirely, um, and uh, made it out. Um, made it out barely, and you know, just sort of looked around it and like was face to face with all of the uh, crazy need for medical care and the incredible inequity and the structural sort of everything that baked into that, which is how I was lucky enough to live through that. Um, and it came back to the States with, with just like a very sort of different, like, man, what am I, what am I doing with myself? Um, 
and right just to just to fast forward so so because i think you skipped us you skipped a step so you were doing your phd years at bu and then you went to india on a long trip other way, uh, around. Or other yeah. way around you went to you were at an indiana long trip almost bought the farm because you had yeah. a really bad bacterial infection i think no, or I, I, something I, we never really found out what it was i'm not sure but it kind yeah. of changed your whole direction and then what so how did you end up doing how, i mean i remember yeah, so, you getting this yeah right and, and you know so so then you go through um you go through in medicine and you spend time in the different rotations and sort of shadowing the different people and like getting to temporarily pretend to be a pediatrician and then a surgeon and then sort of everything else and um and, and most of the time you find uh your sort of resonant frequency like whatever it is that you're sort of like like your cloth is cut in a particular pattern and that's just what you mesh with. And so I kept finding myself at three in the morning on all these different, all these different rotations, just like sort of wondering what was going down in the ER and then like occasionally sneaking down to figure out what was going on in the ER. And I don't know what. Ben, is that you? Was that... It was me. <laughs> Super <laughs> dramatic music of me like sneaking down to the wow. ER. I that's what um, I thought it was too. I was like, did you do that, dude? Yeah, that was, that was I, wish. I wish. I can't even spell my name right some days. <laughs> oh <laughs> I'm, like, make music in the background. But. I told you me, were very it wasn't very me on lucky. purpose, it was my phone. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> In any case, I, I, I realized, you know, at three in the morning and all these times that like this the ER just felt like home. Like it really felt like home. And and the more time you spend there, the more uh, I realized that the sort of chaos and uncertainty and and the ability to really sort of drop into some of the most intense moments of somebody's life and to really do it whatever you and your team can to make a difference there was like what I was cut out to do and like why I was here. Um, yeah. And just ran with it and have never been happier with a decision I've made. Yeah. So one of the things we all hear about emergency medicine is that it involves these crazy shift hours that are, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like residencies only. They always. never stop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so how, to what extent is that true? And what is like being a, uh, you know, 10 years on as an emergency medicine person, uh, are the shifts really as crazy as they're reputed to be? So everything gets better after after residency. And if you're by any chance a medical resident watching this, like life gets better, don't worry. But it, it's, um, it, you know, I mean, I, I remember, I think the longest shift I ever did in residency was 36 hours straight, something like that, which is not pleasant or, or good. Um, With like any all. little nap stand? No, not, not, not that one. Did a bunch of yoga in the hallways. I was always that weird doctor doing yoga in the hallways. That, Still am, but yeah. yeah, no surprises there. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, it, it definitely gets better. And, and shift work is a really interesting thing. It, some of it is really good because you get to um, experience a lot of the way the city sort of lives and breathes at different times of the day and the week. Um, and some of it's really challenging figuring out how to how to balance, you know, taking care of yourself as a human with taking care of other humans is a really big challenge, and especially over this past period of time, which I'm sure we'll talk about in any second. Um, but it's uh, despite all of that, it's like the most fun, most amazing, most wonderful, most horrible, and everything else job that I could ever imagine. So, so we had a a friend, a friend of mine's husband. Well, he's a friend also, but he is an emergency. Uh, physician, emergency room doctor, um, and he had been at Yale, and then she moved to Richmond. He was at a Richmond hospital um, at the outbreak of COVID. He was, I think he came on, he was like one of our first 10 guests or something on the show. Um, and he, we, I remember like having him on and being like, tell us what's happening. And he was like, oh, it's really boring. Like actually right now, like nothing is happening and every like and the and like the hospital is hemorrhaging money because all of the like the elective surgeries have been canceled and all of the other ways in which we like support financially um, uh, emergency room services for indigent populations or people who can't pay or things like that. Like these are all not getting done and there's no one coming to the ER cause people are so scared of COVID. And so they'll like cut their finger off and then just stay at home. Like, no, no, that's like, you, Kate. Yeah, that's me. So, like, 
<laughs> but uh, no, seriously, it's like me. I like keep like hurting my fingers. Oh. I just, mm -hmm. it's been like a long, it's been a long COVID. Anyway. But... Wait, does that tie into yesterday's show? Are you going to get it reattached by welding it onto a giant statue or is that unrelated? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Good one. You want to use like <laughs> noses in lieu of fun. Yeah, I know. Right, exactly. 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 Uh, I thought they no, had to work that out somewhere. We, we, we didn't like, no, I probably have not so far. Not, I mean, I'm actually kind of scared that I'm going to do something like that soon, but no, this is so far enough in the case. But what I'm interested in is like, good. we talked at the height of the LA crisis, I think, yeah. mm -hmm. or maybe it was just at like, maybe it was at the height or maybe it was just starting to get a little better. I don't think so. I think it was actually yeah. at the height and things were really gnarly and you were in a really, I mean, you're, I just, I remember you saying the words like, I went to, I walked by a house party or I went, got invited to a house party the other day and it was just full of people not wearing masks and I just gotten off work watching people drown in their own fluids and die and it was just like wear a fucking mask just wear a fucking mask as i think was what you said that sounds <laughs> very familiar yeah <laughs> that sounds very familiar yeah, yeah I, I mean it's such a it's such a challenging thing right because like everybody's experience over this last year is so wildly different and there's no experiences in this that are, are you know nobody nobody survived this year in a way that is like more valid or real than anybody else's right and so our our friends and colleagues that were in new york that were hitting the first wave where we didn't know anything about anything and masks were running out and it was this just amazing fear about how is this even transmitted and and you know people were er doctors and other staff were literally like you know making their wills and then going into work being like i don't know if i'm gonna come back from this and that's a very viscerally different experience than um, even what I got in LA, wh where the big spike was sort of January, February in a lot of ways. And, you know, we knew so much more about it, having literally learned off the backs of our colleagues and our, our patients and on other humans in other parts of the world, you know, that we knew so much more about it. And, and so the profile of what we were facing and feeling was very different. There was also a lot of obviously fatigue and a lot of people that were, you know, whose businesses had collapsed and whose families were sort of like struggling with all of the other things that we had to do as a community to get through this. And, uh, you know, the last thing I would ever say is that like somebody's experience is more valid than another's going through this. But the truth is that it, it really was, um, you know, I'm an ER doctor. I'm used to death and I'm used to suffering. And I, that's part of my normal life, actually. But this was, in a way, so much different and, and so sort of outside the norm of it. And all, I think all of us are really struggling with um, how we got through it, what we were feeling, and, and how to be a human in the middle of all of this sort of chaos and, and death. And sometimes that came out as serious frustration of trying to communicate to other people that we're living a different version of the world than I was at that time. And, you know, I'd, I'd go back and I, I wouldn't want my friends to see what I'd seen. I wouldn't want you to see what I saw in the middle of that. Um, but also how do you communicate that in a way that like keeps people healthy and, and makes people understand that like, yeah, this isn't a fake thing. This is real, right? Like I'm, I'm having people say goodbye to their loved ones via iPad uh, and then putting them on a breathing machine, knowing their chance of ever making it off, like, is less than 50 50. Uh, I'm routinely every day being was being in the middle of that spike being like, I'm probably the last voice. like, I might be the last voice you hear. Let me choose my words really carefully when I say that we're going to take care of you. And like, that's a lot of weight. It's a lot of weight for for all of us to be going through and to mix that with um, the currents that were like, Oh, this is a this is fake nonsense was all right. So I want to challenging I wanna <laughs> ask you why you think your experience is no more valid or real than the mm -hmm. people who uh, were perpetrating that foolishness. So I, mean, I, I can I can yeah. understand the the yeah the it's my, my experience was wildly different from an ER doc or a nurse in New York uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and I you know it's no more valid than that. But you know. You guys were trying to save lives mm -hmm. uh, in very difficult conditions, and some other people were having house parties and not wearing masks. And there were still some other people who were uh, 
like uh, <clears throat> Tucker Carlson, who are encouraging people not to get vaccinated and being paid $25 million a year to do it. Why why shouldn't we have a certain consent? Yeah, totally. You also don't need to so, like take this. This doesn't need to be in a political direction. No, like, no, I, I just like, I a, just like, yeah. I think this is a super important question, right? And and I'm going to, I'm going to answer it in a very ER doctor standpoint, which is that I'm going to, I'm going to take as my sort of highest virtue in the moment, like efficacy, uh, okay. as opposed to necessarily a theoretical grounding in something. And, and I think that's a really important distinction between like what I do as an ER doctor and maybe what like, an internist does when they have all of the time in the world to sort of create the most theoretically appropriate response to a problem. So I'm sure that there's a really fascinatingly deep, like ethical discussion around that question that you just had, that you just said, which is important and worth having as a community and as a, as a society. From a purely like effectiveness point of view, me going to somebody and saying, you're being an asshole does not actually fix anything. And if I can start the conversation from saying, you lived your life and I lived mine, now let's figure out how to get through this together and what we're gonna do next. I think that's like probably a better way to do it. And, or at least a more effective way to do it. It doesn't make it necessarily, like, I have so many strong feelings about so much of what you just said. And, you know, like there was uh, months when I was going to sleep and the images of people choking to death in front of me were just replaying constantly in my head and I have to carry that. and. You know, like there's a huge part of me that, especially in that moment, wanted to turn to the people that were being like, "This is this is bullshit," and be like, "You want to just like get in here for a minute and like, uh, do, would you like some of this?" But that doesn't fix it, right? That doesn't fix it. And, and I think coming from like a a standpoint of like, "All right, so all of us are suffering. What are we going to do about it?" is maybe more effective. Um. So this is like a really nice segue, I think, into talking about your book. The emergency mind, and I'm gonna pull. I like had it up, and now it's disappeared because, of course, it has. Um, the but, but at least uh, it has its name spelled right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Fingers crossed. Sharp name. Sharp name. <laughs> like, also, I will point out that I misspelled the title of my PhD thesis when I wrote that. Also, you know. I'm not sure I, if this is a friend I, or not. It's but... why we're friends, Dan. There's like, this is like That's literally fine. like, I like, this is like one of like, this is like, we're not detail oriented people. We're big picture thinkers, but, right. um, but seriously, um, wow, that is a terrible link. Okay. Sorry. Uh, but that is the link to Dan's book. Um, wow. the emergency mind wiring your brain for performance under pressure. Um, Dan, when we were hanging out in 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. you were, I think, starting to meditate and practice um, Buddhism. Thank you, Ben. That's perfect. Um, and like, I have no idea. I haven't read this book yet. I have bought it, but I have not read it. Um, and nice I know I, I've just put a tear. I have a link to it now. So now I like, uh, uh, sorry, wait, did I say I bought it? I have not read it. Um, but like, but I, I am so interested to hear um, about how you think, I'm so interested to hear about how you think emergency medical practice has, like gives you this new type of way of viewing performance. And I actually kind of think performance might be many things to many people and doesn't have to actually have to be under pressure necessarily all performances to some degree under pressure, but like also some of what you're saying seems like a bit of a long-term strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I'm kind of curious to what you have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, uh, can I come back to that in one second? Cause somebody yeah. said something in the, in the chat that I think is oh. a really important point, which is, which is just who needs detail when you're in the ED. And I, I'm pretty sure that was tongue in cheek, but, but nevertheless, th that's actually like a really interesting and subtle point also of what we do as ER doctors, which is that, you cannot fix everything and you can't possibly be correct at everything that you do. So triage and understanding what's actually incredibly important and what is less important is an enormous skill set that's easily translatable into outside the emergency department sort of realms. So I'm going to be the guy that spells my name wrong in a box. I'm going to be the guy that spells like the title of my PhD thesis incorrectly because at the end of the day, like nobody's life is on the line for that. It's just me being, you know, sort of like looking like an ass temporarily, which I'm happy to do. But if I'm in the middle of putting a, you know, central line into your neck, I'm going to be the most detail oriented human in the world for those like couple of seconds when I absolutely need to be. And so it is amazing how you can do that too. Yeah. It, it's, 
so so this this is sort of like the crux of what I've been doing, which is like, how do you do that, right? How do you think under pressure in a way that allows you to deploy your knowledge in these really tense situations? And what if it is innate? Probably not a lot of it. What if it is a skill? Probably almost all of it. And then like, what can you train and how do you train it? And how can you train it? And how can I train it given our different sort of like uh, visions of what we spend most of our time doing? And, and what in there is accessible to everybody and what is there is accessible with like deep practice and sort of like, where do you draw those lines? Um, and I think that's such a fascinatingly awesome thing to sort of like dig into because this is like my tagline of everything I do, right? So like ER doctors are not, right? Like we all face emergencies in our lives. We all face these moments when like literally everything is on the line and whether you succeed or fail, it all comes down to what you do in a couple of moments and all of the training, all of the skill that you have, can you really sort of drop it into the world when you need it in that moment? Um, and how do you get ready for that? So, yeah, so so walk us through that. Um, I, I take it the book is an exploration of the of how to develop that skill set. Sort of, yeah. The book, the book to me is the creation of a framework and a vocabulary about performance under pressure around which we can sort of build, iterate, and experiment. Because there's not a lot of sort of framework about this, right? Like, like you know, I, I uh, you know, got my MD PhD from from Boston Medical, and then did my residency training at Harvard. Came out and work at LA County, which is you know one of the best places in the world to do emergency medicine, and. Despite everything I just said, I, you know, I found myself still really struggling to figure out how to deploy knowledge under pressure, right? Like, how do you do it? How do you really do it? And then how do you turn around and teach it to somebody else? And there's not really like a good framework for it. Um, and there's individuals who have developed skills in it, but, but all too often what we were given was sort of this like, you know, sort of this like version of like, oh, well, you know, you'll get it. Uh, it, it sort of arises naturally from from you figuring it out. Like the more times you see patients and the more repetitions you do, you just sort of naturally develop a skill at it. And like, I, I think that's not true. And I think that's fairly a dangerous sort of mechanism um, because it, it creates this ethos where like, you're either given it as a gift at the beginning of your life, or you just sort of accidentally develop it as you keep going. And, and certainly like time on target is important for developing these skills, but it's important, but not sufficient for developing these skills. So, so how do you develop, how do you like deliver deliberate training into performance under pressure? Um, and that's what the book is about, is about the, the models that I use personally, but then also models that, you know, um, Navy uh, explosive ordnance disposal experts use and, um, people who are high power coaches in all sorts of fields, like what do they use to perform under pressure? And how did you come to study it in others? So the natural instinct of the uh, uh, emergency room doctor would be to say, hey, here are my experiences and how mm -hmm. to transfer, the, you know, and, and the generalizable principles they embody. But going that extra step and saying, hey, there are the other, these other careers that are employing similar skill sets. Um, uh, how, you know, how did you go about studying what the other sort of extreme performance under pressure um, uh, careers look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, it, you know, the deeper you study a problem, the more you recognize it's parallel in other universes to some extent. And, and the more you can sort of explore how other people tackle it, right? So um, so Ben, you're, you're a martial artist, right? We were talking about this earlier on. And what, what do you study or what did you study? I have studied study? Taekwondo and I've studied Aikido. Right, so, so you know that when you learn a particular block or whatever in Taekwondo, right? And you, you know how to execute it in a, in a vacuum. And then you try to apply that block in a sparring match. It's a very different universe. Sure. Right. So you can do it on paper or, you know, sort of in space, but can you do it when it really counts for it? And it, like to me, I, I kept coming back to this idea that, OK, I could learn how to do a, you know, particular submission from Kesekatami in Jiu Jitsu in a slow thing or even in a slow roll. But why couldn't I do it in the middle of an actual match? What does that teach me? And so I started 
you know, you start asking other martial artists about it. Well, how do you how do you do that? Well, how do you translate this concept into this? Well, I don't know. Sometimes you you know, sometimes you're a lumper, or sometimes you're a splitter. You break it down into components, or you sort of like mash it up with other things, or you practice it under pressure, or or you sort of like play with it. And well, okay, that's fascinating. Like, who else must be thinking about this? And then and then that got me to sort of ask this deeper question, and to sort of come to the conclusion that like actually applying knowledge under pressure is a skill kind of a weird radical thing to say because it's not really something that we normally consider a skill. Well, I actually think that it I think I think of it as coming into the realm of triage. Like I think that triage is the only and I it's actually funny because not funny, but like I've had but I watch I um I know that it's just TV, but I watch and like I watch MASH a lot. Mm. Um, like, and so like, as a, as a kind of, as a kind of an idea of how like medical communities work or like how people triage, I don't know, it's like fine. It's less sensational than ER or whatever else. But generally speaking, like the idea that there is a triage is like this idea that people hold in their mind as like, as if it's, it's like something that is like very clear, like you triage this and this and this and this, and that is how you go through emergency type of situations and decide which knowledge to use in which situations. But Is that wrong? But, but triaging doesn't help you address the patient in front of you. It merely tells you how to prioritize the 30 patients in front of you. Sort right. of, right? So so all of these are mental models, right? Triage is a mental model. They're all like, mental models. They're and all the models. idea of the primary, secondary, right. and tertiary yes. survey from the American Trauma Life Support, which is m what you might use to address the patient in front of you is a mental model. So what my book is, is 25 mental models that ER doctors use to perform under pressure. One of them, cool. like triage isn't even one of them because it's sort of implicit in a bunch of the what, other wait, ideas. When you say mental models, but, do you mean like heuristics in like a sense? Like just kind of just like... Are they are they different than heuristics? Yeah, I, so way? I think they're different. I think they're different than heuristics in the way that like triage isn't really a heuristic, right? It's sort of a, it's sort of an approach to a particular type of problem that okay. you can use in one way or another. So the first one in the book, for example, is the concept of sort of of finding the calm in the storm. And it, essentially, it, it talks about the fractal nature of existence, right? Which is that in the middle of calm moments, we have chaotic moments. And in the middle of chaotic moments, if you keep drilling down, you find more calm moments, right? If you go all the way into the middle of the sort of like sound, you find peaks and valleys of the wave, right? And so as somebody who's performing under pressure, one of your jobs is to find the calm moments in the middle of the chaos. Yeah. And that's a mental model, right? The idea that even in the most chaotic moments of a life or death trauma, gunshot wound to the chest, you can still find moments of calm to sort of leverage yourself is, an, is a mental model the way I'm sort of using it for this book. And so, but to go back for a second about triage, like, yeah, we use triage. The triage is in some sense, the idea of sort of like first things first, uh, or the idea of who can benefit most from your skill now, needs your skill now. And certainly that's an important component of it. In some ways it's parallel to the models that you might use to take care of a particular patient in front of you, right? We usually go from ABC, airway breathing circulation, with the idea that if um, there's a problem, if I fix a problem with your lungs, but you can't get air into your lungs through your airway, your lung problem doesn't really matter, right? Which is in a sense triage that you put the first things first. So there's parallelisms to it and, and there are these skills. And now, it, does that matter for anybody who's not an ER doctor like airway breathing or circulation? Well, okay, to, to an extent you can be like, no, that's like only useful in emergency, in emergency medicine. But my guess would be, and not knowing much about, you know, sort of like law or trial law, my guess would be that there are certain circumstances where there's a variety of options you could take and you need to sort of prioritize them based on what actually makes the most difference first in your moments. Um, I, I would just say that like, it's not actually procedural. It's actually weirdly, it's weirdly substantive. Most of the analogy comes it's like from a substantive level. Ben, would you disagree? No, I'm 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 now having trouble understanding what bounds the field of emergency medicine. Yeah. Because yes, <laughs> yes, that's a great I mean, question. People can. I mean, obviously, it doesn't include radiation oncology mm -hmm. or a sort of the more esoteric uh, branches of any field, but people can come in with an emergency presentation of 
all kinds of things. Sure. Um, the diversity of problems is immense. And, um, and so if you're applying this, um, okay, what's the highest impact approach that I can take mm -hmm. that will, like, how do you do that across so many different fields that are each by themselves, uh, you know, can be quite arcane and, and complicated? What's the point at which you say, uh, I can't, this isn't the emergency room isn't the appropriate place to deal with this problem oh yeah like so so much in that question right and and so i think there's there's two really key directions to take that one is the question of like how do you apply these models across wide varieties of people and patients coming in at once and and there's a whole section in the book about sort of balancing competing forces about like, how do you manage the care of the individual with the good of the community? What about when those two things are directly at odds with each other? How do you handle that? Or how do you handle multiple people needing a scarce resource at the same time? Uh, like how do you balance and triage across different things? Like really fascinating questions like that. And part of the reason that I, I wrote this is because like, I am 100% still figuring this out, despite being a professor of emergency medicine, and all of us are. We're all sort of operating on this really uh, nice edge of sort of uncertainty and pressure and trying to figure out how to, how to apply these concepts in the moments when we need them the most. It's not easy. Um, the other part of your question is sort of like, what defines emergency medicine? Well, you know, we're the first people you see when you walk in the door for unplanned and acute care. And in a way, that's my answer, period, right? Like, no matter what you come in with, if it's unplanned, I'm the one that stands in front of you. And sometimes that means what I'm doing is telling you, like, yeah, dude, it's cool, here's a Band-Aid, like, go about your life. And sometimes what I'm telling you is, you know, okay, hey, I've got to cut your chest open and put this tube in it immediately without anesthesia or you're going to die right now. And the balance of sort of knowing those two and then understanding where the limits of my expertise is, right? I'm not a surgeon. You don't want me taking out your gallbladder. I can certainly diagnose that you need or that you might need an operation, or that you have cholecystitis, an infection of the gallbladder, and then I can get you to the right person to take care of that definitive care. Sometimes I'm that person, sometimes I'm the definitive care, and sometimes I'm not. And, and that balance of sort of like pushing and pulling and that is part of what we do. All right, so I have a complicated question that is going to involve uh, the disclosure of some per personal experience in emergency rooms uh, that goes to the has elements of triage and elements also of the difference between emergency room care or emergency room doctors and uh, and specialist doctors. Okay, so, but if you have a spot you want me to look at, I don't think no, we should do this no, on live. No, okay, no, no. it's it's just. A, <laughs> I have um, a, acute anaphylactic allergies to mm. nuts and sesame seeds. Yeah, yeah. I've had them my whole life. Um, I have. Um, <sighs> You know, they are florid and dramatic. Yeah. They are also erratic in the sense that sometimes I will ingest, um, you know, some quantity of something and um, I will not have a full blown reaction to it for reasons that are unclear to me. Um, and um, so there's always this question, you know. Do you go to the emergency room with whatever level of symptoms you have, sure. or do you, you know, take some Benadryl and hope it goes away? Um, yeah. And there is a dramatic difference in the answer to this question that you get when you talk to the emergency room people who you show up with and, you know, you're kind of a guy with a little bit of face swelling and you know, your eyes are watering and you're uncomfortable. Uh, and when you talk to allergists, because uh, the emergency room people are like, you know, I got gunshot patients in here um, uh, and you're sneezing. Um, and the allergists are like, and one of them literally said to me, well, you've won the lottery, you're still alive. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, they regard, you know, the slightest... Uh, I mean, they want you to shoot yourself with epinephrine if you come within 100 yards of, of um, and I, you know, have often felt very caught in the middle of this because I don't really want to waste 
emergency room time. On the other hand, when you come in with an actual anaphylactic reaction, you are right at the front of the triage line with those mm -hmm. gunshot patients. And so, and the line between not being there and being there is often 60 seconds, you know, of, because the trajectory of the reactions are very unpredictable. And so I, I guess, it, so this goes back to the question of validity of human experience as a doctor. Mm -hmm. Is this a situation where you look at it and say, hey, if I were an allergist, I'd react that way too, because, you know, because the allergist doesn't have to think about the other patients who are being held up in because a bed is being tied up with somebody who's actually not acutely ill, but there's a protocol we have to follow and we got to keep them for a certain number of hours and blah, blah, blah. Or is this a situation in which it really is a, a legitimately a matter of perspective and that if you had a patient who had a theoretical possibility of dying from exposure to almonds, uh, you would give very cautious advice. But if you're the person in the emergency room who's like, yeah, he's theoretically eaten some, he's eaten some almonds and his eyes are watering, but it's not a big deal, um, you react that you react with a certain annoyance. So that's a very long winded question. Yeah. I mean, certainly no annoyance, right? I, I think that's, I think that's not quite it. And, and it, Kate, I can't hear if you're saying anything or not. It, in any case, um, yeah, I mean, so, so that's like, a, so first off, I should. I was saying that you're a saint and you would never be annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I, I will wrap everything I'm saying in the overall thing that like uh, I can't and and won't and there's no way I can give you good medical advice over over a problem. I, I am no, not asking for of course, of course. I think it's more like a problem of like the more problem of like an acute long term problem like yeah. that that you know that like you know the parameters of and how do you fit that into an emergency medical situation? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, so, so like, I think like implicit and maybe like a level below the question you're exactly asking is like, how do humans deal with uncertainty? How do we process uncertainty? How do we process? And then there's, there's layers of uncertainty, right? So if I were to give you a, um, uh, an actual probabilistic thing, which is to say like, okay, maybe 20% of the time when you start at position one, you're then gonna go to position two. And then sometimes you go on to position three, like some percent of that time. Like you have a very predictable course of your allergic reaction. And we don't know where you are on this, but we can guess with certainty what will happen next to you. That's one thing. If I give you a stochastic process, that's more like, okay, one out of every whatever times, you're just gonna, you're just gonna freaking die. Okay, well, what do you do with that information? Right. And that's sort of like what you're telling me, right? You're telling me sometimes when I eat almonds, I have a nice easy progression and I move from product one to product two and then this happens. And sometimes I just kind of almost die. So, all right, well, how do you design a system of care that processes that uncertainty? How would one design a system of care that processes that? Particularly if you're unaware of the variability and you have to design a system that also takes care of the 10 year old who, if he smells a peanut, will die. Sure. Right. Sure. And there's actually, we have, we have sort of actually two jobs in the ER. And this isn't maybe always known. So I think it's worth saying this out loud. But if you come into the ER, my job is to take care of you, certainly. But my job is also to preserve reserve capacity to care for whatever bus crashes 10 minutes from now. And we're sort of also the safety valve for society like that. So right. the decisions we make need to be correct on net, sort of for the whole community. That doesn't mean they're optimized for any one individual who shows up. And, and you think about this in the way like you tune an instrument, right? Sometimes you want an instrument that plays in the key of G, and sometimes you want an instrument that plays in the key of C. And sometimes you want an instrument that sort of spans a bunch of things in the middle in there. And when you make conscious decisions about how you tune an instrument, how, which is equivalent to saying when you make conscious decisions about how a particular algorithm, person, or, or part of society handles uncertainty, there's going to be trade-offs from that in one way or another. And that's not an easy thing to make trade-offs for. So. It depends, right? An allergist is able to say something like, yeah, you should be okay because if you don't, if you become not okay, they send you to see me. 
I'm on the other end of that I'm not okay sentence, right? My, me and my colleagues are. Um, and that debate about how do we both, how do we process uncertainty is so freaking fascinating. So fascinating to me. How do we process uncertainty in a way that, that like, is useful and important and pushes I love us that you, forward. I love that you even pose it as like a how we do this is fascinating because I think it poses the fact that we don't have a fucking answer to it. And even though like all of these, I mean like, one of the weird things about becoming adult is that you realize that like adults are just adulting and for making it up as they go along. And like, you know, so too medical doctors, so too lawyers, so too, so too like journalists. And I think that this is like something that is the fallibility of human, human instincts is like, I think not something that's like concretely appreciated. Um, Daniel, uh, hello. It's so nice to see you. Um, You're wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> Daniel, you had a couple of questions. I would, I would basically say, like, I think that your 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 latter question about um, the mental models and CDC. Well, actually, do you think that this that that um, mental models uh, question is been answered, or do you think that you could still ask it? I don't think I had a question about mental models. <laughs> oh wait, I have you. Oh. Sorry, I apologize. Why don't you Thank ask you. the question that you do? That was Ox. That was yeah, Ox. That was away. Ox. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Fire away. Go ahead and ask your question. I'll ask two brief questions. The first is what is your reaction to the CDC guidelines that they just released regarding masks? And the second is what has the medical community learned about the long haul COVID symptoms and what are people's chances for recovery? that experience such symptoms. Yeah, man. So I, I'll start with this. I'll start with the um, the second one first, which is that I, I'm the wrong doctor to ask that question to. As an emergency doctor, I see you at the beginning. My expertise is like you being acutely ill. My expertise is not at all long haul symptoms of things. And I, I don't know. Um, and I'll admit that I don't know because I think that's a really important thing also as the medical community to say what the boundaries of our knowledge is. Uh, and I, I sometimes think about it in terms of like, this is what I can say with my doctor hat on, and this is what I can say with my human hat on. And you know, I'll, I'll often, if I'm treating a young patient um, when their parents are there, I'll ask them questions as a doctor and then I'll say, well, what do you think as the mom of this kid? Because I think your mom knowledge is equally important to my doctor's knowledge in a lot of the areas of this. So. I don't know, man. I, I'm going to defer that. I'm just the wrong doctor for that question, to be honest. No, um, totally. For the CDC guidelines about masks, like <sighs> some of it, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, I love that it hopefully encourages more people to be vaccinated, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I am vaccinated. I got it as soon as I could. Folks have asked me which one I took. My answer is I would have taken whatever one was sitting in front of me. I would have taken the Russian one or the Chinese one or any of the American ones or anything uh, to get through this still breathing and vertical. Um, now, it, it's a deeper question about whether or not converting from uh, a mask mandate to a not mask mandate is the right move across a national swath. I'm not sure how to answer that. I think there's a lot of calculus that goes into it and whether or not that's the right decision is maybe a micro environment decision. Like, is it right to have masks in some places versus others? I think stepping down is an important goal as we move forward and, and get through this, but that's a, that's a tough one. Yeah, that's a really tough one. Charles T. Um, Charles, it's so nice to have you back on. You haven't been here for a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah Hi. Busy. Hey guys! Yeah, actually, I've been busy yeah. with busy with work of my own. Uh, little tiny good as you should now. be. We're but, just um, it's just nice to have you back in the community. Yeah, nice yep. to see you. Um, sure. Uh, so I have two questions. One is how do you maintain bedside manner during emergency situations? And I asked this question, stemming as someone who had had some poor bedside manner man, manner from a, a doctor in an emergency situation. And secondly, what like emergency lessons have you taken from your broader, like what have you learned in the ER that you can apply to your broader life? 
like that you think are like life lessons? Sure. Good, good questions. I think, um, you know, uh, what is bedside manner, right? Like, like you want, like people want to be treated like humans and they want to, I know I want to be treated like humans when I was like a human, when I'm at a doctor and respect from one human to another is an absolute core component of that. It becomes a little complicated in emergencies because, um, you know, sometimes the most compassionate human to human, I love you as a fellow human thing I can do is like cut your damn chest open without anesthetic and stop you from dying. And like, that's actually really good bedside manner is to be like, yo, so sorry, stab. (laughs) (laughs) So sorry, stab. Is that what you said? That it's like Mm -hmm. amazing. I was like, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) <laughs> like that's yes. not always the case and then like should only be like done in like very very acute moments and balanced with like a much more detailed sort of nuanced discussion about stuff but I-, I think it's an interesting question about like compassion and empathy right and what is it that you really want from me as a doctor right do you want me to feel for what you're feeling do you want me to feel a sense of responsibility to try to take care of you and and how do you do that and so for, for me, the answer is always sort of trying to remember and, and continuing to remember that like, you know, you're a human, I'm a human. That, that's the basis of literally everything. And like, if you hold that thought that you're a human and I'm a human, that sort of gives you the answer to a lot of these other questions about like, well, how do you continue to, to treat people like humans and to sort of, um, to find that evidence, that sort of like link of bedside manner for it. Uh, now that's, um, that's a start. And, and the more overwhelmed and exhausted that we are as humans uh, taking care of people, the harder it is sometimes to create that link of humanity. And um, so part of the answer is like, you take a break for a second and you drink a cup of water if you can, and then you go back and see the person. And like, that's part of it. Um, but, but actually also it, it sort of leads into the answer of your second question, which is what have I taken away from being an emergency doctor? Like. I feel so absolutely lucky, so lucky to get to be um, pressed against the grinding wheel of life and death over and over and over again in a way that I think a lot of people don't get. And so you get put in these situations where you're watching the suffering and you're watching the end of life and you're watching the beginning of life sometimes if you're on a great shift and you sort of get in the middle of this um, sort of some of the deepest moments of being a human. And and from that, I think can be the bridge to an incredibly deep connection to your fellow humans. And that can be the bridge to a deeper, better version of bedside manner. Um, but that's also like what I take into my normal life, which is that, that experience of like, well, geez, well, what does matter, right? If maybe I'm gonna blink out of existence tomorrow, if maybe my number's up, right? Because I think about this, because every patient that comes into the ER to see me that that suffers and dies, those patients had plans tomorrow. Those people had plans tomorrow, right? I have plans tomorrow. Does that mean today my number's up? Like maybe, maybe my number's up today. And if that's true, if my number's up and I don't know when, what's important? What do I do? What do I spend my time doing that matters, right? There's that Buddhist, some, this is the Buddhist quote, which I will probably butcher, which is some version of like, if if death is for certain, but time of death is uncertain, what's vital and what's trivial? So Alice Lee begged off and didn't ask this question, but I really wanted her to, um, which was basically so like- let's, So let's uh, emphasize that point that she copped out. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, she just like, I think that like she probably had like, maybe she was getting drinks with friends and like she didn't need to like hang out with us anymore. Anyways, how did your, but, but she asked, how did your meditation practice that Kate mentioned, and I did mention this, um, and this is like, and you just mentioned the Buddhism, uh, like, and I do think that it, like, it, like you said you before you said that you were the 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 emergency room doctor that did yoga, mm-hmm. and there these are not the same things. So like, just to be clear, like, but Buddhism yeah. is not yoga. It's not like you know, it's like not meditation necessarily. But like, how did meditation, like as a practice, factor into like how you wrote this book, and like, and to like how you thought of the twenty five, like like the twenty five examples that you use in the book? Yeah, I, I mean, 
again, I think that when you're exposed to life and death so much, it's pretty natural to start to to think about some of these deeper themes about like what it means to be alive and like how are you supposed to handle things and then like you know the answer to the answer to how do you handle life and death is not found in a medical textbook except for maybe the technical details of how you handle life and death right so so where is it where are where are our answers to that and and i think that wrestling with those questions is one of like the deepest most beautiful most wonderful parts of being a human um, and also sometimes the scariest and craziest parts of being a human and you know, the first version of this book, the, the thing that I really started sort of doing when I, I started writing to begin with was really just to process some of the things that I'd, I'd been through. And for a long time, I didn't want to talk about any of it. I didn't want to talk about any of the cases. I didn't want to talk about anything because it was just, it was too much and it was too hard and I, I didn't know what to do with it. And a, a friend of mine said something to me to the effect of like, you know, if you don't think about it and you don't talk about it and you don't learn from it, then they, the people stay dead and nothing happens from it. And as, in a sense, you're sort of wasting the suffering that they went through. Yeah. But if you can think about it and process it and learn from it and teach the next generation of people how to do it better, then your suffering is not wasted. And, and Dan, what would you want? Man, I, you know, I just sort of sat there for a minute and I was like, you know, okay, I, I hope I die really old in a way that is like painless and wonderful. I'm and gonna dissect the fuck out of your body. Do do it. And, uh, <laughs> let's just get that as an isolated sound bite, huh? But um, <laughs> you know, but failing that, failing that, like if I don't die in uh, a way that is old and peaceful in a million years from now, I hope I die in some spectacularly weird way that allows people to learn as much as possible from how I die. And that there's so much suffering that comes with it that it can be this rich, fertile ground for other people to learn. From. That is a sentiment I can say in my 51 years of life I have never heard before. It is amazing. I love you. What else Dan. are you going to do, right? Like, you're going to die anyway. You may as well be useful when you're dying. Oh, my God. On that note, Genevieve de la Farra, you have finished your third year or your second year, your second year <laughs> of law school. She's not even fucking done. I wish. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Of law school. Uh, it is so lovely to have you here. Please ask her a question. Which one? Uh, whichever you want. Your choice. Oh, OK. Um, so I think I'm going to ask the second one. Um, just as a patient, if you think your doctor's panicking, any recommendations on how to effectively advocate Whoa. for yourself? That's interesting. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Um, hmm. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'd say like when, um, when I'm in a really tense moment and I'm feeling it, I'm feeling my heart rate up, I'm feeling my sort of like stress response going or what I teach my resident doctors to do um, when uh, they're going through really tough moments is to encourage them or to encourage myself to take my own pulse as a method of sort of like biofeedback self calming, right? So I, I, you take two fingers, you trace down your thumb and then you find your pulse right there and then you just feel it and you just sort of like take a couple beats and take a breath. And as long as there is not a like overwhelming thing that has to happen in that exact second, which occasionally there is in the emergency department, but as long as there isn't, then taking a few beats to slow yourself down and take a couple of deep breaths like that actually makes an enormous difference to change your physiology and in doing so to change your, your mental state as you're processing these things. And there's a um, amazing neuroscientist out of Stanford, Andrew Huberman, who runs the Huberman Lab podcast that has an entire episode about what ways of breathing alter your parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system in what directions and there's some really cool stuff in that there is a there's a ton so i actually so again like we all haven't read your book but we're all now very cute into your book which is super great and i've dropped another like link to it recently but the, a bit like how much about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic and like can you elucidate like that difference for a moment between those two like systems i think that it's not something that's generally understood by audiences 
Yeah, the short version is that if you look at the part of the nervous system that's outside of your head, right, that is all of the nerves that run down your spine and then run from your spine out into all of your organs, that you have this incredible crosstalk between your body and your brain, and it really goes in both directions. Um, and you're, uh, on a very gross scale, you're sort of governed by two systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system, and they're in balance. And you can think um, basically of the sympathetic as sort of upregulating and sort of driving forward and um, exciting and being up and awake, and the parasympathetic is being more sort of calm and product like protective and sort of down regulating. And you exist in this balance between them, and over time you sort of like rev up or rev down depending on what you need to do. Um, but balancing that uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, collectively called your autonomic nervous system, um, is a something that um, ER doctors, but also athletes and free divers and sort of everybody else is, is really spending a lot of time thinking about, which answers some of this question of like, how do you physiologically prepare to function at your best under pressure, whatever that level of pressure is you're facing? Yes, that there is like a huge amount that your conscious mind prepares your unconscious mind. And there is a feedback loop in which those two things exist. Mm -hmm. And that like they, that the, the medical world generally treats them as. Yeah, I think the, that more and more we're, we're learning about the links between the mind and the body and, and that they go both directions and that, you know, we're sort of um, uh, getting away from the very like Platonian dynamic of like, there's your, there's your brain and there's your body and there's like maybe some other stuff, which like clearly it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, but, but I will say like, you don't have to know anything about the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system to read the book because it's not written at that level. Yeah. I want to ask you. Uh, one one aspect of performance under pressure necessarily by one means or another involves mistake evaluation. Mm -hmm. That is, I think you can't be an emergency room doctor over any significant period of time with the amazing diversity of problems that are coming in with various degrees of acuteness, mm -hmm. some of them life-threatening, without screwing up. Um, and I've been thinking as we've been talking about, like, the various levels of screw up, right? There's the screw up that, uh, hey, this person was going to die anyway, and the care was suboptimal. And so, yes, there was a screw up, but kind of no harm, no foul, because there was no prospect of a particularly good outcome. So the marginal impact is low. There's the screw up that actually makes things worse. Mm -hmm. And then th that is you could imagine a, a baseline, a, a, a standard of care proper delivered, properly delivered would have resulted in outcome X and you got X minus whatever. And then there's the uh, error that um, precludes um, you know, it doesn't actually do harm, but it precludes uh, what would have been more effective treatment. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question is, as a, as a general matter, how does, how does evaluation and self-evaluation of error fit into a, uh, a program of evaluate of sort of maximizing performance under pressure it's a good yeah. question absolutely and so applicable to everything outside of the emergency department too right i mean just going back to the martial arts mat for a second right like you make a mistake and then you see some outcome from that mistake and sometimes it's direct and obvious like you get punched right in the face right. Sometimes it's not direct and not obvious and you sort of realize like oh i could have been in a better position if i'd done that slightly differently and i think that that whether you're talking about martial arts or you're talking about emergency medicine, like I am an imperfect human and I practice an imperfect science and I practice it imperfectly. And holding that as the space that I start from is an incredibly important piece of this, right? So if I accept the fact that I'm not perfect and then try to try to figure out what do I do and how do I get better at it? How do I build systems that, that sort of allow things to happen better? Um, is an important piece. And one sub part of that is um, distinguishing between performance and outcome, 
right? So, uh, and there's um, Annie Duke, who's a incredible decision-making expert uh, slash former professional poker player talks about this is the idea of fielding, which is that you decompose an event into outcome, which is what happened, the patient lived or the patient died or something like that. And then performance, which is what part of that outcome was in any way directly relatable to what I controlled, right? Because if you adopt sort of a stoic philosophy concept of, of life, like, like there are certain things which are in my sphere of control and certain things that aren't. And so one part of processing a bad outcome or a mistake is to be very clear with what you had any control over and what you don't. Like I, I operate in a part of life, my day-to-day -day job is sometimes the die is just cast. It doesn't matter what you do, the person is gonna pass away anyway. And what you can do is try to relieve suffering along the way. But part of that though is what do you do when you there is a, something in your performance that you could be doing better. So that's a really fascinating thing to dig into and there's all sorts of cool tools for that. And I think that, again, part of it relies on sort of what your goal is for that. It, like if you want to beat yourself up and sort of rake yourself over the coals, you can totally do that. And like part of that is is appropriate to feel some of the suffering about what's going on. But I think a lot of it has to be focused on what happens? How did it happen? What systems could I have built that would have prevented that from happening? What do I do next? What do I do better? How do I show back up tomorrow and make sure that that suffering wasn't wasted, that I can do better for my patient that comes in tomorrow, that my whole team can do better for my patient that comes in tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot about that, that. I mean, it's such an important piece. Dan, mm -hmm. we're all going to read Emergency Mind in the interim, and then we're going to have you back on to talk about it. Oh, and I would I, love like, to. No, like I, I really think like I, I, I think that I think that all like that both Ben and I are very intrigued by this, like these like heuristics and these like this kind of like these models that you have built out into like a system. I think it's really interesting. So um, thank you so much for coming on. It was like a total utter joy. Uh, and, Great to meet you. Yeah. Meet and you. Ben. So good, good to, to meet see you. Kate. Um, and, uh, and we are going to be back 22 hours and 56 minutes from now until It'll then, Ben, it's just us. It's and just Scott, us. Who's now part of us. Who's now part of us. It's like a weird one of us. trifecta. One, one of, of us. us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we will have, it will be just us Saturday, which will be us and Scott. Would you, we shouldn't have to say that anymore. No, it should, it should just be us, <laughs> just be us. Just it's us. just that when we say just us and we're the only ones on screen, exactly. it does imply that Scott exactly. will be here, but Scott is going to be here because he's yep. one of us. Yep. One of yep. us. But he's been writing, yeah. he's been like crunching on writing his book. So he's like very, anyway, uh, Dan, it was lovely to hang out with you. I will talk to really you has. soon. Yeah, and until talk to you guys then, soon. Ben? We don't have fun anymore. But fortunately, we also don't have um, uh, uh, major COVID spikes in either New York or LA right now. And that is to a great degree uh, uh, the uh, thanks to the work of large numbers of medical professionals individually and particularly in combination with one another. So uh, thank you for your part in that. Mm. Yeah, thank, thank you guys. You, it was great to hang out with you.